tonight we're continuing this series of messages on Christ's miracles. Something about Christ's miracles I'd like to note before we begin. Nicodemus said, we know that no man could do these miracles as you do except God is with him. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a truthful observation. Nicodemus didn't see all the ramifications of it. As you can detect by Christ's answer to him, what he said was true, and as we see Christ's miracles, we want to see in them a confirmation that God was working through him. Mm -hmm. See, who Jesus is is bigger than what he does. Amen. It's possible to embrace a concept of what the world calls Christianity that is enamored or captured more by what Jesus does in the arena of flesh and blood than who he is. Yes. Mm -hmm. The arena of flesh and blood is going to end. It's going to come to a grinding halt one of these days, but Jesus will never end. Amen. He is alive forevermore. <clears throat> with that in mind, we're going to deal with the text tonight. Only Luke records it of the, when Jesus healed ten lepers. That text is found in Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. It came to pass as he went to Jerusalem, it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass, as they went, as they went, as they went, mm -hmm. they were cleansed. And one of them, when he, turned, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are found that return to give glory. There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Now I want to look at the background of this particular miracle, and it had, each of these have some peculiarities. As you can see, here's one that is kind of different from the other miracles. Nine-tenths, which is probably kind of an accurate percentage. Nine-tenths of the people that Jesus healed didn't appreciate it. I believe that probably is. I don't know whether that, what the exact percentage is, but I have an idea that it's probably in that range. Now, what are the surroundings of this? It's important to note because Christ's miracles, they happened in, in his ministry, you know, kind of a flow of things. And uh, here's, here's the background of this. This is quite, quite remarkable. The background is the disciples had asked Jesus to increase their faith. And here's what prompted them to do this. This is Luke 17. It's right after he told the, the account of the rich man and Lazarus. Just finished telling about it. And the rich man landed up in hell and Lazarus ended up, ended up in Abraham's bosom. And then, right after that, he said, It's impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe to him through whom they come. Uh -huh. The rich man committed an offense. He neglected Lazarus. Woe. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he be cast, in, be cast into the sea than that one of these, of, then he should offend one of these little ones. Which Lazarus was one of the, he wasn't a baby. <laughs> He's one of God's little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. 
And if he repent, forgive him. Oh, see, some people leave that first part out. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn to thee and say, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Well, disciples, what do you have to say to that? Lord, increase our faith. The Lord said, if, thou, if ye have a faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it shall obey you. Amen. Well, you go out after we leave tonight. Step out. We've got several trees in the yard here. Step out and try this, and it'll tell you what measure of faith you have. Hmm? That's what he said, isn't it? But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say to him by and by when he has come from the field, Go and sit down to eat meat? Will not he rather say unto him, Make ready there wherewith that I may sup and gird myself thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and after thou shalt eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. We say, I don't, I don't think so. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done that which it was our duty to do. Now it's important to see here what he was, what he was talking about. You can't fulfill the requirements like forgive 70 times, or seven times in a day. You can't do this by a routine. Right. Amen. It's going to all be done by faith. Mm -hmm. That's what I said, increase our faith. And if you have faith, it can whatever needs to be done can be done. Yes, amen. If you have faith. Faith versus spiritual exploits. You know, I thought it occurred to me as I read that there are all type of people that have, have figured out telling people routines on how they can forgive one another. Well, this is being taught. Little steps, procedures, methods on how you can forgive one another. <laughs> if you manage to do it, it still count zero. After you've done all that I commanded you, zero. Doesn't even count. Faith is what counts. Yes, amen. That's why the disciples say, increase our faith. Amen. Now, these, this is the background to this, and they're walking along on the way to Jerusalem with this in their minds that they've had. On the way to Jerusalem from, from uh, the upper part of the Promised Land and passing through Samaria and Galilee. If you look at... Uh, Israel, you'd have, you'd have Samaria, Galilee, Judea. It's at the bottom. Jeru they head for Jerusalem. Jerusalem's in the southern part, Judea. They're passing from the upper part down to the lower part. And he's on his way to actually offer up his life. We're now the last few months of his ministry. And his ministry took an abrupt turn in the last few months of it. And he set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem, and he traveled about roughly maybe 65, 70 miles on foot. You'd be, you'd be journeying roughly about to Springfield, walking from here to Springfield, ministering as you go. That, that's the kind of situation we have. It took him a while to get there, and he's going through these towns and villages. But his aim is to get into Jerusalem. And as he travels along, he enters into a certain city. We don't know which one it was. And he is met there by ten lepers. And they, according to the ministry of the law, kept their distance from him. The law said you had, the lepers, if you had leprosy, you had to cover your upper lip with your fingers and say, Unclean! Unclean! Don't come near. Like a caution sign. It would be nice if people of the world or carnal would say to you, unclean! <laughs> yeah. Be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> they're just they're defiling. Uh -huh. yeah. Even though they don't cry this out, they're defiling. The law told them to do this. And, uh, and he met them as he's journeying on toward Jerusalem. I want to say a word about him journeying to Jerusalem because it's quite significant. This started back in Luke 13, four chapters earlier, when he, he 
changed his focus. He's headed now toward Jerusalem. When he first started out ministry, his focus was to light in the area, to shed light in the region of darkness. That was his that was his purpose, to declare the Father and shed. Now this is all shifting now. And now his ministry is to prepare to lay down his life a ransom for many. In Luke 13, 22, it says, He went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. That's where he's, where he's going. He would not be deterred from it. Our text in Luke 17, 11 reminds us he's on his way to Jerusalem. Some few chapters later in Luke 18, 31, He took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Now, geographically, it was down to Jerusalem. It says up to Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem was located in the mountains. And the temple itself was on a mountain in the midst of mountains. We're going up to Jerusalem. Luke 19, 11. As he heard these things, he added to speak a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem. So by Luke 19, he's getting ready to enter in the city. We eventually is going to be crucified outside the city. This was his target. Jesus' target. He didn't come fundamentally to heal lepers. He didn't come primarily to feed the multitudes. He did this, but this was not his underlying purpose. His underlying purpose was to lay down his life and take it up again. And along the way, he's showing mercy. This is part of keeping himself pure. A suitable sacrifice. He showed mercy along the way to these people. He didn't miss his father's works while he's going. He knew he was going to Jerusalem. Some people, they can see the target, but they're kind of oblivious about the way that leads to the target. Here's Jesus headed for Jerusalem, but here's a, along the way, here's one of the father's works, ten men confront him and one of the father's works shows up and as I mentioned to you according to the law <coughs> they stood afar off <coughs> here's what the law said this part of it Leviticus 13 45 the leper in whom the plague is his clothes shall be rent he had to, he had to tear his clothes I <laughs> like that he had to tear his clothes so he stood up tear his clothes his head be bare Shave his head. He shall put a covering upon his upper lip. He shall cry, unclean, unclean. All the days when the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone. Without the camp shall his habitation be. So whatever you may think about the mercy of God and the love of God, whatever you may think about it, after all said and done, when you're unclean, you're outside. Amen. And you have to warn people you're outside. I'm carnal. I'm carnal. People really would be nice if they did do that. Yeah. Went into board meetings and some of the men said, I'm carnal. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, like leprosy, sin does exclude you. That's right. Now, I, I trust no one here is caught up in sin. But if you were, <clears throat> you, would feel, you would not feel at home here. Yes. That's right. And we wouldn't want you to feel at home here. Amen, that's right. We're not about to do anything to make sinners feel at home here. Amen. Because then we'd feel at home or we shouldn't feel at home. Mm -hmm. See, leprosy is a type of sin because it's, it was a creeping sin. It was a creeping malady. It crept through your whole body and finally just devoured you. You lose the sight of your eyes. You lose the sight of your hands. You lose the sight of your feet. It's like sin is. Sin is like this. It just gradually eats you away. So these, uh, what are these men going to cry out now? They knew the law talked about uh, certain procedures that a leper went through. Well, what, what are they going to ask the master? These lepers, ten of them. Maybe they sang like a chorus. They said, um, see, some people, when they heard John the Baptist, for instance, let me give you some examples here. Some of the difference between Jesus and John the Baptist. John the Baptist has three different occasions, Luke 3, verse 10, 12, and 14. And here's what the people said. What shall we do? That's what they asked John the Baptist. Nobody ever did ask John the Baptist for mercy. 
He said, what shall we do? And he'd tell them what to do. Their particular juncture of life. But these... These lepers, when they see Jesus, they don't ask Him, what shall we do? They said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Mercy. Mercy. <laughs> I think these men, even though they proved to be rather nine of them, rather obtuse, they had more of a working knowledge of mercy than some people do today. They knew mercy can get things done. Have mercy. And quite a few people, of course, asked the Lord Jesus to have mercy. Remember that woman from Canaan, one gospel writer calls a Syrophoenician woman. She came out of the coast of Canaan and said, Have mercy on me! Yeah, that's what she said to Jesus. You remember the two blind men in Bartimaeus, they said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me! Or you might remember the man whose boy was demon-possessed and the demon cast him in the fire and the water and he said, have compassion on us. You don't want to underestimate compassion and mercy. You don't want to get so close to Sinai that you forget what mercy is That's right. and what compassion is. Sinai, see, Sinai doesn't hold out mercy. I Nobody at Mount Sinai said, mercy, mercy. They said, don't speak, don't speak. That's what happens under the law. Have mercy on us. In other words, I am unworthy. What a, why, how can I commend myself to you? Look, we got leprosy. What have we got to offer? Nothing. If we're going to come close to you, you've got to have some kind of tender compassion toward us that we're going to get nowhere. Have mercy. Have mercy on us. Well, how's Jesus going to respond to that? Does he say, well, it's about time. It's about time someone asks for mercy. Does he say that? In fact, he actually doesn't make any comment about it. First it says he saw them. I wouldn't be surprised, but some of the disciples may not have seen them or heard them. They uh -huh. Maybe one of those times they were arguing among themselves, who's going to be greatest? Remember they did that one time. <laughs> one time. Maybe they were oblivious to these men. I don't know. But Jesus saw them. That's what it says. He saw them. And Jesus is that, uh, he's that way. He's a very observant. If you want to be around, uh, around Jesus, you've got to learn this about him. He knows what's going on around him. He's very, very observant. Amen. Yes, amen. In Matthew 9, 22, it says, Jesus turned him about and when he saw her, that's the woman touched his garment, when he saw, he saw her. Mark 6, 48, the disciples are rowing, toiling and rowing in the, in the sea. It was, See overcoming them, and it said he saw them toiling and rowing. So you had Jesus observant. He's from heaven. He's a son of God. He this is a low zone so far as he's concerned. It's a zone of irritation from one point of view. It's a zone of trial from another point of view. But he sees what's going on here. And he uh, Matthew Mark nine twenty. The man brought his son to Jesus and. It says they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, the boy. So I'm pointing out here that the Lord Jesus sees. If you were to talk about it, this from an old covenant point of view, this would be God making his face shine upon you. See, that would be the old covenant way of saying this. He saw them. A compassionate face. You remember the ironic blessing. Well, part of it was, look, the Lord make his face to shine upon you. As the Lord notice you, see you, perceive you, think upon you, consider you. See, that's what that's talking about. Psalm 31, 16 says, make thy face shine upon thy servant. Let's look upon us with mercy and with compassion. Or Psalm 67, 1, God be merciful to us and bless us. See, look at us, perceive us. Cause your face to shine upon us. Psalm 80 and verse 3 says, Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. See, all through human history, informed people have sensed this. But if you can ever get God to look at you and see you as you really are, that he'll, mercy will rise up will rise up in him. It's, it's God turning his face from you. That's the frightening, frightening thought. Uh -huh. These lepers picked up 
picked up on this. Psalm 80 and verse 7, Turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Two very few verses later, they like they list of some of the first repetitive choruses in the Bible. Here, and you won't hear one like this, incidentally. Today, here's Psalm 80, verse 19. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. Cause thy face to shine, we shall be saved. See, that's show mercy. That's mm -hmm. that's a translation of show mercy to us. In Psalm 119, 135, make thy face to shine upon thy servants. Yes. Showing mercy. So if you want. God to bless you. That's really what you want. You want a benefit from the Lord. You have, he has to focus his attention on you to do this. Mm -hmm. He can't like throw something over his shoulder. Mm -hmm. Kind of throw it over his shoulder to you and bless you and go on his way. He can't bless you and, and you be separate from what he's doing and apart from him and not involved with him. And God sort of straightens out your problem and you go on your way and forget him until the next time. This isn't the way God works. And these lepers do this. If we're going to get something from Jesus that we want, mercy, we're going to have, he's going to have to look at us even though we're unclean. Yeah. You have to come to the point where you're willing to have him see you in all of your, yeah. perhaps, defilement. Because mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what arouses his mercy. Mm -hmm. When you take someone who's deeply stained and defiled like these lepers were, and they're willing to come under the scrutiny of Jesus, they won't stay lepers. Amen. And you won't stay sinners. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. And they they sense this. Now under the law there were there were procedures for for lepers. The fourteenth uh, chapter of of uh, Leviticus outlines that the 13th chapter has a lot about lepers. The 14th is after the leopard had been cleansed. It's an extensive procedure after he'd been cleansed. He had to take two birds. One of the birds would die. Another bird would be dipped with some scarlet and some blood, blood sprinkled. The bird would fly away. After the blood was sprinkled on the leper, he had to wash his clothes. It, this after he was cleansed, he had to wash his clothes, he had to shave off all his hair, he had to tarry outside of the tent for seven days. This is for a cleansed leper now. Mm -hmm. Then after seven days he had to shave his head and his eyebrows, and wash his clothes, and then wash his flesh. Then the eighth day he had to take two lambs, and the man with the lambs had to come to the door of the tabernacle. The priest had to take them and offer a trespass offering. Place some of the blood of the sin offering on the right ear, the right thumb, and the right big toe of the man. Sprinkle it seven times before the Lord, this blood. He had to take some oil from a cruise of oil and put some oil on his right ear and his right thumb and his right foot. And then after that he could present him clean. It's like a two-week procedure, presently. Well, what do you see in this? Say, hey, it takes an awful lot to get rid of sin. Mm -hmm. And don't you think for one moment that being forgiven is easy. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. It may look like it's easy because it's so effective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but a lot of work went into it yeah. on the mm -hmm. other side. Mm -hmm. A lot of work went into it. And Jesus is, t this is teaching us this in the law. If you're looking for an easy fix, maybe it just happened overnight, all be over and all be forgotten. Well, it's not always that way. That's right. At least you've got to see that it takes an awful lot on God's part yes. to forgive you. Amen. God is great, but He can't stand sin. God is merciful, but He hates sin. He can't abide with it. There's got to be a reason for Him to show mercy. Amen. And Jesus has given Him the reason. Mm -hmm. So Jesus has got to yeah. loom real big yes. in your eyes. Yes. So Jesus, he calls out <clears throat> to the men, and he says, Show yourself to the priest. That's all he said. That's all he said. And so they, uh, they went on their way. That was it. And the scripture says, as they went, mm -hmm. they were cleansed. Yeah, mm -hmm. As they went. Now see, there was another leper that Jesus just touched him and made him whole immediately. Mm -hmm. 
But this isn't what happened. What happened here? As they went, they were healed. It's like Naaman, as he was dipping seven times in the River Jordan. He came up the seventh time he was healed. See, it's in the process. You get the blessing in the process of following. You get the blessing in the process of obeying. You get the blessing in the process of believing. Yes, amen. So as you launch out, see, you're sowing to the Spirit. You, mm -hmm. And you'll get the blessing. So it wasn't a mere routine. They weren't healed by just a routine or just a touch. Not at all. Now as they're... Uh, suddenly the attention shifts from the ten to just one. They were healed. They were cleansed as they went. It doesn't say they all knew. It actually only says one of them saw it. Uh -huh. Only one saw what had happened. I don't know what... I don't know, but the others said they were cleansed. Mm -hmm. They were cleansed as they went. Mm -hmm. But one of them saw it. Mm -hmm. Did the others see? Well, maybe they so were, were so intent on being obedient, they didn't see what had happened. Mm -hmm. That's possible. Mm -hmm. You can be so intent on doing what's right that you don't even see what he's done. Mm -hmm. I has blessed you. Well, as soon as he saw what was happening, he went... He went back. Oh, he must have, this cleansing must have happened like early on. It must not have been like a mile or two miles down the road because he turned back right away and uh -huh. fell down before Jesus. So it must have happened really, uh -huh. really quick. But he saw it. <laughs> you know that in, I can say for myself that when I came into Christ, it was, it was quite a while because before I knew what had happened, what had really happened. Some other people I've seen, they, they were, they had the advantage of not having their mind cluttered up with a bunch of stuff, theological stuff, so they seen it pretty quick. But for some of us, it took a little while. <laughs> took a little while down the road before we saw what had happened. But as soon as you see, back to give thanks. Huh? Amen. Back to give thanks. So he went back and he glorified God, the scripture says. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice. See, they called out loud for mercy, didn't they? What they said, they called out loud for mercy. Mm -hmm. So they called out loud and giving glory, too. Yes. You don't want to be more firmer about seeking mercy than giving thanks. It should, it should increase. Your fervor should increase. He knew he wasn't healed by a procedure. He didn't say, thank God for that routine. Just write that down. <laughs> he had asked for mercy, and that's what he'd received. He knew it. He knew it. <clears throat> now, God's glorified when you perceive what he's done, and you declare it. God's not glorified just because you, you did something. Because you saw what he did. That's what, that's what glorifies God. And he did this. Now, it says that he fell down... <clears throat> He fell down and gave Jesus thanks. He fell down. There's a lot of the phraseology in the Gospels where they fell, fell down. It's a, it's a, a much humility that I must acknowledge this, but I for a long time was in a religion that wasn't noted for its humility. I can tell you, nobody, hardly anybody ever fell down or kneeled or went, fell prostrate or. I mean, this is kind of unusual. We didn't see much like this. That was some of the other more radical religious groups did that, but we we didn't we didn't do much of that kind of thing. Why not? Well, because we really didn't see what was going on. That's why. People don't have trouble as do they doing this when they see what's going on. And uh, he saw what was going on. He fell down, and he gave thanks. <clears throat> Why well, do you think Jesus would be glad? Well, praise God for this. <laughs> At least one person came back. Is this how Jesus is? You suppose this is how he is? Even though when there's uh, bad times, like there were the times of Malachi, they that feared the Lord spake off in one with another, and the Lord took note of it and made a book of it, do you suppose he was oblivious about who didn't come together? No. Think this like is a matter of ignoring with God? Well, it isn't, let me tell you. First thing he said was, Weren't there ten? Yes. Weren't there ten? See, some people don't see this side of Jesus. Uh-huh. What do we got? We got maybe 35, 40 people here. You suppose in this vicinity that this is all the people? 
Don't think it for a moment. There were, there were ten cleansed. That's what he said. He didn't say there were ten that ought to have been cleansed. That's not what he said. He said there were ten cleansed. Where are the nine? Why didn't he say, well, that probably went on to the priests and were being examined. That, why didn't he make that observation? Why didn't he say, well, uh, <laughs> in due time, they'll, they'll come to see it in due time. Thank God this, this one's come back. Well, that isn't what he said at all. Were there not ten cleansed? Were there not? You don't want to lose this kind of sensitivity. There's been a lot of gospel and a lot of divine work done in the area we're in. And there's still questions like this going on. Maybe in our agency, what, haven't there been ten or 15,000 cleansed? Haven't there? Where are they? It teaches us that the Lord expects the return. Amen. of the people who have been blessed. Well, Jesus notes that fewer give thanks than should, and from the beginning of humanity and the fall of man, God's been this way. He said, Adam, Adam, where are you? See, that's just like where are the nine. Where are you, Adam? He's still asking questions, uh, questions like this. Where are you? He's seeking the souls of men. Psalm 106, 13 says to the people, they soon forget his works. Now, some people call it backsliding. You might look at it as waxing cold. Both of these are true. But how about this one to kind of startle us and make us awake? They forgot his works. Yeah. Yeah. Or how about the second part of the verse? They waited not for his counsel. See, do you really think, do you really think that God sent Christ just to take away your sins? Do you really think that? Do you really think that God sent Christ just to clean you up? Do you really think that? This tremendous investment that God's made in salvation, is it just so you'll be, if you're young, so you can be a good boy and a good girl? Is that really what this is about? No. It's a lot bigger than that. Yes. Cleansing is the start, not the consummation. Amen. Being made pure is the commencement, not the end. Receiving mercy is at the beginning of the race, not at the end of the race. They were not, Romans 1.21 said they weren't thankful. And neither were they thankful, and God gave them over to, to a reprobate mind because they weren't thankful. And how he refers to this, <laughs> to this man, this stranger, this stranger, this person who's not supposed to be familiar with me, this person who hasn't been going to church all his life, this person who wasn't raised, you got to kind of bring it up to date here, this person who wasn't raised in a Christian home, this people, this person who never had devotions every night, this, this person didn't go to Bible college. This person didn't go to daily vacation Bible school. He didn't have all these advantages. He, but he seen more than the others. Which meant the others were Jews. He's returned, this stranger. Can't find anybody but this stranger. See, often those of the least advantages receive more. I can remember as a young minister, when things were kind of, I was learning some of those hard things to learn. And one of the things that the institution taught me was that we were the one true church and everybody else was wrong. We were the, we had the truth. It's very strong to talk. We, had, we are the true New Testament church. Now there's some, something that would confuse me. We work for people and, and down the road, and I, I don't mean anything by using these names, but it's just the way it was. And I'd come across the Baptist on the road, and he seemed to be more sensitive than the folk was in my church. And I'd have to say, this, str this stranger, huh? <laughs> he seems to have been made it a little further along. He seemed to be more interested. This is the kind of thing Jesus is talking about. The Jews had been cultured 
But they, their heart, you can't be altered by culture, even by divine culture. Yeah. You've got to hit, cry out for this. And this Samaritan asked for mercy, and he saw that he got it, and he came back and he gave thanks. Now, how, what's Jesus going to respond to this man? He said, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Mm -hmm. Your faith made you whole. See, Jesus didn't say one word about your whole. Mm -hmm. When he sent these men, he just said, Show yourself to the priest. Mm -hmm. Be like saying to a woman who was a harlot, Go thy way and sin no more. Amen. Be like saying that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So what do we see from things from this incident? It's quite a remarkable incident. <clears throat> Those who are aggressive to seek help should be aggressive to give thanks. Amen. I can't begin to tell you the number of people that have come to me in an hour of crisis that I have no and I I want to help. But this isn't how many come to give thanks. And you do not want a culture of religion or an approach to religion or an approach to Christianity that makes you eager to cry out for help but not so eager to give thanks. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Because this does not set well mm -hmm. with Christ Jesus the Lord. Right. Our zeal should increase, not mm -hmm. decrease. The purpose of Jesus is not just to solve our dilemmas and then we continue on you know, living is normal. That's not it at all. This Samaritan saw it. And we should know what to ask for. We should ask for mercy. You remember that man, that publican smote his breast and said, Be merciful to me, a sinner. He went on his way. He said, Justify. Went down to his house, justified. Jesus said, Know what to ask for. Maybe when you're asking the Lord for some particular benefit, or maybe recovery, or maybe to resolve some dilemma in your life or in your family or some illness or whatever. Maybe it'd be better to ask for mercy. Maybe that'd be a better procedure in coming before the Lord. See, these men knew what to ask. They didn't say, wait, we, we heard that you healed a leper down there in Galilee. We heard about that. We heard you sent out your disciples and they cleansed the lepers. We heard about that. And they ask for mercy. See, actually, any any assistance you need from God boils down to a need for mercy. It doesn't make any difference what it is. In fact, it says that we have access to the throne of grace. Let's come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now, it is another wonderful thing to see that in the process of obeying, if something supernatural is going to happen, that's that's the context that's going to happen. In. While you're doing, yeah. see, while you're doing what the Lord says, now you can you can do what the Lord says in a different sets of uh, frames of mind. Yeah. You can do what God said to do, saying, "Well, at least I'm doing what He told me. I want to want to be very precise now. Do it just like He told me to do it." And the important thing is to be obedient. And well, this is, this is a good attitude. Don't get me wrong, but I suggest that it's good to kind of look for something to happen mm -hmm. in the process of obeying the Lord. Now, you want to strive to be the person who does see what's happened. Yeah. Here were ten, one-tenth saw what had happened. Mm -hmm. Said they were cleansed, as the scripture says, as they went, they were cleansed. Mm -hmm. One of them saw it. Mm -hmm. And he knew who was to receive the glory. Now, I think it is true that some people have faith to pray but they don't have faith to praise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have faith to ask for mercy, but they somehow lack faith to give thanks for mercy. Now you can judge for yourself which is the greater. I don't know if these lepers stayed cleansed or not, but I kind of have a suspicion they didn't but I, from the way Jesus talked. But I will tell you that... Uh, there is, great, there is great virtue before God in being honest when you go, just as you were when you came. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are tempted to, as they say, shell the corn down, or be honest with God, or know what they seek. When they're coming for the, for the grace, 
Well, they're not quite as straightforward and honest and forthright when they give thanks for what has happened. Let us learn from these, uh, this incident, these ten lepers, that you can, you can be among those that are distinct. You can be among a group of people that have, in fact, in fact, they did receive something from God. Mm -hmm. But you, God's looking for the one who sees yes, amen. that they saw have received something from God and give them thanks. Mm -hmm.